Commonwealth's attorneys and I have concluded that the NCAA sanctions were overreaching and unlawful. Someone's got the bubble product, and you and I as a consumer are going to want to buy. The country needs a comprehensive energy plan. Good morning and welcome to WHVL's For the Record. I'm Andrew Klissa and I'm pleased to be joined by former Penn State football coach Jay Paterno and award-winning author, by the way. Thank you so much for being here. Good to be here. So, Coach, I just want to congratulate you on some of the recent developments with regarding your family and your dad with the restoration on the 409 wins. I'm curious, what was it like the moment that you found out that was going to happen? Well, it was kind of a surprise. I mean, we had, we had some indication that there were some talks going on, but, uh, but obviously it was, it was important that it was a big step forward and get, really getting to the end result of all this is really getting to the truth in the NCA and what their role was. And so, it, you know, it, it was good, but obviously, just like my dad always raises, you know, hey, once you accomplish one thing, you got to work on the next goal. And so that's how we kind of took it. Immediately after that happened, I was watching college football on ESPN, Matt Millen was on, Joe Shad was on. Joe Shad said that the statement that was released about calling it a victory, he said that some people were taking issues with that. Do you feel like maybe that was a poor choice or is that just a misunderstanding and people wanting to look into something that's not there? Well, I think one of the things that, that has happened and it's come out in the media is that uh, there's this misperception that somehow getting the truth for Penn State and finding out exactly what happened is in some way an affront to people that were victimized by, by the, the crimes that were committed. And I think that's, that's just not true. It's just the two things are not necessarily related. I think it's important that the truth does get out because it, uh, the narrative that this could only happen at a place like Penn State or under cover of some enablers or uh, a cover-up uh, allows people to not look around their own towns and see what's going on. So I think the two things can go hand in hand. The Corman McCord lawsuit, what were your thoughts when that took place? What are your thoughts that it was settled? And also the trustees, there was a meeting that happened to be that, that day. What was your thoughts when they released a statement about appreciating the, the NCAA being appreciative that they were able to take an interest in the case? Well, obviously I think that was you know, not, a, not a good statement in this regard. Um, to sit there and say that the NCAA had good faith or that they had an interest in the case, I think when you look at the, the evidence that we've seen, the NCAA certainly did not operate in good faith. Even you see the emails and discussing things like Penn State is like roadkill, uh, you know, and them, you know, really not being honest in how they were dealing with us. You know, Mark Emmert saying that the, the pretty university presidents wanted a, a death penalty when Ed Ray in his deposition said the vote was 19 to 2 against it. Um, I think that's unfortunate that, that we're taking that stance that the NCAA somehow operated in good faith because it's very clear they did not. Do you think that ever happens without the fans of Penn State and the people that wanted to stick up for your father and stick up for the Penn State tradition and the Penn State way, success for want, with honor. Does that ever happen without those people who fought for the last three years? No, and I think, that, you know, the lawsuits obviously are something that really kind of forced the issue. Um, it's, a, you know, when people suddenly have to put their hand uh, and take an oath and, uh, and testify under oath on camera uh, in a deposition, suddenly they have to start telling the truth. Whereas they can kind of, you know, cloud things in the media, that kind of thing. So I think those obviously forced the issue. And the support of so many people that wanted to see this and wanted to see the truth come out has certainly helped propel the people that were involved, like Corman, like McCord, like our family, like some of the former players that got in the lawsuit, the trustees, faculty members that got in the lawsuit. So I think certainly it had a very, very big part to play in it. Is it frustrating sitting back and I don't want to use the term like glacial pace, but that's kind of how the legal system more often than not operates. Is it frustrating that you can't come out and say, this is, this is what we want, this is all, everything that we need, that you just have to let time go by and eventually stuff begins to work its way out and filter out? Yeah, there's some days it's frustrating. Some days, you know, you, you wish it could be all over and that, you know, everybody would kind of own up to what they did and, and move on. But that's not going to happen. And you have to understand that. And I, you know, I'm all, you know, I do a lot of reading. And in War and Peace, Tolstoy wrote, the greatest warriors are time and patience. And I've reminded my brothers and sisters of that on many occasions, my mom. And I said, you know, remember war, time and patience. I said, but on top of that, we have the truth on our side. So we've got three really good things in our pocket. So, uh, you know, it's just going to take some time and you got you to gotta understand that. And that's the way it works. I asked Trustee Lebrano this question a few weeks ago when Karen Pete said 
in two years this would all be forgotten. Your reaction to that then, and how do you evaluate that statement now? Well, I think it's absolutely misguided. It showed an absolute lack of understanding of, of how the media works, it had a lack of understanding of people's memories. Uh, unfortunately, you know, if I say the words Kent State to, to anybody of a certain age, they think of a, a shooting that occurred there in the 70s. Unfortunately, the way this was handled by the Board of Trustees and really bringing this entire issue back to Penn State, when Penn State really was not the central part of this issue, um, when people say Penn State, certainly for the rest of my lifetime, there's going to be an association that comes to a lot of people's minds right away. And that's, you know, for her to think that it was going to be gone in two years is just naive. Do you believe that they destroyed the entire reputation that everything Penn State was within seven days? No, I don't think they did, but they certainly did a lot of damage. I mean, they, people still understand Penn State's a great academic institution. Uh, people that have really paid attention still understand that our athletic program is, was a model uh, nationally and continues to be a model nationally. Um, but there are a lot of people that have, believe me, I see it on Twitter, I see it on emails I get. Uh, in fact, a lot of them are in the book. Uh, people that have a very different opinion of what Penn State is and was all about. Uh, and we have to continue to fight that perception and f fight those false narratives, and it's going to take some time. I want to bring up a tweet that your brother Scott had a couple months ago. He said on Twitter, to know a full story and not be able to tell it. How frustrating is that? Well, you'd have to ask him on that one, what he was getting at, because, uh, you know, I, I don't follow his tweets very much. He and I don't agree on some things politically. Uh, but that said, um, you know, Maya Angelou, he's really paraphrasing something Maya Angelou, uh, Angelou had written about, uh, there's no pain like bearing an untold story in your soul, um, which is kind of what he's getting at. And, you know, you want to get out and scream and yell and say to people that are, uh, they don't have the story right, you want to correct them, but you got to take your time and do it right. I asked Todd Blackledge when he was in town uh, for the Ohio State game how frustrating it is when he does speak out, then he gets all the hate stuff on social media. In fact, you had a tweet a while ago about a personality called Cruisin66 on Blue White Illustrated saying he was playing with slander. How tough it is to, to not engage those type of people? Well, you got you got to pick your spots, and and what you what you realize on social media is the vast majority of them are just looking to get a rise out of you, and if you engage them, then they continue to do it, and that's something I've always, I've always even when I was coaching, even before any of this happened, uh, you know, if we lost the game, there would be a zillion things, and you just got to learn to ignore it, and uh, and you don't look for it. So most of the time, I just ignore it. But uh, the one issue you had talked about is that particular guy had gone on a message board and a friend of mine had said, hey, you know, he's saying this, this, and this about you. And the things he, were saying, he was saying were absolutely not true and um, really borderline libel. Uh, so I just happened to make a comment about it just so that people would know that uh, he, this guy wasn't, he was, you know, portraying himself as having some information, just wasn't accurate. We are talking with Coach Jay Paterno. We will get into the book, The Paterno Legacy. Back with more on WHVL's For the Record right after this. Welcome back to For the Record. That is Jay Paterno. I'm Andrew Clissa, and we are talking the great book, The Paterno Legacy, authored by Coach Jay Paterno. And Coach, I just wanted to say I am very much enjoying the book. I'm only about halfway through right now. First question I have, why did you even decide to write this? Well, when some of the things happened in November of 2011, um, I understood pretty quickly that we were in the middle of something pretty big. And so I started to take some notes here and there and just kind of so I would have recollection of things that happened because it was so, you know, it was, everything happened so quickly. And I thought I would write a book just about that week to kind of put people inside one of those media stories because until you're in it, you really don't get it. But then, you know, when my dad died, uh, you know, I decided, you know, if I was going to write something that had anything to do with him, uh, I didn't want it to just be about that. So it really just kind of exploded into this much bigger project. And, uh, and I wanted people to get an understanding as to what he was like as a father, what he was like as a grandfather, what he was like as a boss, from a first-person stand standpoint, for someone who was in the room. So uh, it really kind of took on that, uh, that persona. The book really holds no punches. Um, regarding the, some of the trustees that are mentioned within the book. Did you feel it was necessary to put that in, and why? Well, you know, the night he was fired, uh, and that's the chapter you're talking about mostly, is uh, the night he was fired. And, and, and what I wanted to do is just express how I felt that night. And those are true feelings about, you know, those, aren't, those weren't written 
eight months later saying, this is what I want to say I felt that night. That's how I really felt that night about certain people that I knew were on the board of trustees, that I knew knew my father for decades and knew him better than what they were hearing in the media, yet never reached out and never stood up for him. So yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the emotions are pretty raw in that, in that chapter and they're, pretty, and they're very honest and that's how I felt. Those four individuals that you singled out, have they reached out to you since? No, and they, have, they hadn't reached out to me before I wrote the book and they didn't reach out um, when my dad died. They didn't reach out after, you know, they had voted to fire him. Um, so, you know, there hasn't been any really any, any interaction with them. That obviously it puts a, there was a strain on, on family friendships that went, went back decades. I'm just wondering, your mom, how was she able to get through that with the help of you guys? Well, she's a strong person uh, and a lot of faith. I mean, she's somebody that's very, very religious, and uh, that's something she leans on quite a bit. And, you know, she's got 17 grandkids, and she's got five kids and spouses and the whole nine yards. There's a lot of people she can lean on, and she's got a lot of good friends here in town. So that's really been something that not only is she strong, but she's got a lot of strong people to lean on. The one chapter in the book, and, and child abuse is never easy to talk about, but you actually have a personal experience that you didn't know how was going to happen when you were 12 years old. If you could just dive into that a little bit. Well, I was riding a bus, cat a bus home from Park Forest, and uh, you know, a guy kind of started talking to me on the bus. And I was by myself, and he you know, just started, when we got off the bus, he propositioned me, and, and I, I got the bus by the hub on campus, and he just said, hey, by the way, and he propositioned me, and I, and I just couldn't get away from him fast enough, but when I went home, I didn't tell anybody, because in my own mind, I thought maybe I had done something wrong. So I put that story in there just to kind of explain to people, you know, that there is an understanding why sometimes people don't come forward in these types of crimes because there is an immediate, at that, at that age, your tendency is to think that you've done and somehow invited that, you have somehow have done something wrong. Uh, and I put that in just to kind of share the experience, not that I want people to feel sorry for me or anything like that or that it scarred me, it didn't. Um, but to, I did, there's some understanding there. Have any of the Sandusky victims reached out to you or your family either before or after the book, or have you guys reached out to any of those uh, victims before or after? No, because a lot of them still remain anonymous, so we don't know exactly who's who and that kind of thing, so uh, there's really been no exchange, no, no dialogue whatsoever. What would your father think of the book? If he, if he could read this book, what, what would have been his reaction? Um, you know, I've, I've thought about that a few times, and you know, everybody in my family had a draft of the book before it was published. And I got really good positive reaction from them. There were a couple of stories in there that my brother and sister said, oh, I wish you wouldn't have told that story or, you know, that kind of thing. But um, by and large, uh, I feel like, you know, at the end of the day, when it was finally done, the last draft went off, you know, I felt it was a very honest account of, of him as a father. It's not a puff piece. I mean, the one thing about it, it, it doesn't, you know, it, it's honest. And it's also not, uh, you know, it's also pretty honest in my own failings in life, you know, as a son, as a student, as a father sometimes. I didn't feel like I had done the best I could do for my own kids. So it's pretty honest. So in that regard, I think my dad would be pretty happy with it. I think Paul Feinbaum actually mentioned that in your interview with him on the radio show a couple of months ago about that this was a, a brutally honest account of, of, of failings or, or shortcomings and also the great things that have happened. The week of the Nebraska game, specifically the morning of the Nebraska game. There, there's a chapter dedicated to that. How tough was that for you to actually get out and coach that day before that, that morning even, even actually happened? And then you had all the extra stuff. Well, you know, I think the thing that, that, that a lot of people did not know is, you know, at that point I had stopped by the house. I always parked my car at my parents' house and walked up to the, to the, uh, the office and then I would walk over to the stadium. And um, normally I just park the car and go, but I had stopped things. I wanted to see my mom and dad because, you know, my dad wasn't going to be coaching and, there, there were, you know, it, it was tough. You felt like part of you was torn, like, am I being disloyal by continuing to coach even though he's not there? And when I went in, I, my sister was on the phone. There was a note there that said, uh, your dad coughed up blood again, had to take him to the hospital again. Now, I didn't know he had gone Friday. And my sister saw the note and then grabbed it and said, you're not supposed to see that mom. Dad didn't want you to know he was having any problems. So now I know my father's in the hospital. I got to walk the game and coach. And that was, you know, that was weighing on me a little bit during the game because here I am not knowing what's going on with my dad. Uh, so, but, you know, he trained us so well. You know, he, there was a blue line in the practice field. And every time you crossed that blue line, he would say, you can't do anything about anything other than getting better as a football player. 
So when I got to the stadium, I mentally crossed that blue line and said, I got a coach today and that's all I can handle and all I can deal with right now. I can't do anything about my dad, so I got to focus. And that, that carried me through, it really did. It's hard to imagine you becoming a bigger fan of your father. Did this book make you a bigger fan? No, but it, no, I mean, it, like you said, it's hard to be any bigger, but um, I think one of the things that was good for me is, you know, when he died and, you know, the viewing, 50,000 people came to viewing, big public memorial service, all those things, and then the letters that we got from so many people and answering those letters. Um, this, when I sat down to write this, was really the first time that I was alone in a room to really deal with it and come to grips with it. So in that regards, it was a very, very uh, helpful in sitting down and letting some of these memories come back and really kind of appreciating the life I had with them. So in that regard, you know, it did probably help me appreciate them even more. You are watching WHBL's For the Record, and we are talking the paternal legacy. Back with more right after this. Welcome back to WHVL's For the Record. We are talking the paternal legacy with author and football coach Jay Paterno. Coach, a lot of the book dedicated to the time with your father, a lot of that time on the walks home. How special were those walks, especially looking back now? Well, they're great because it was, it was, you know, when you're one of five kids, it's not always easy to get one-on-one -on -one time with your dad. And when you work with them and there's all kinds of people pulling and you've got your own kids pulling at you, with that, when I had my own family and things like that, that, there was one time that you knew there was gonna be 10 or 15 minutes to just talk and, and listen to them and, and learn things from them. And uh, you know, I learned very early on to listen to when, when he would talk because he usually was gonna impart some kind of wisdom to you. There has been national authors su such as Dennis Dodd, Ivan Maisel. The one thing that's always disappointed me as a journalist. Bob Costas seems to be the only opinion shaper in the country that's actually picked up on saying, we need to look more at this entire subject. In the future, do you feel like guys like Bill O'Reilly on Fox News or Pierce Morgan on, on CNN, even Scott Pelley, 60 Minutes, guys like those, do you, is there an effort by you guys to reach out or an effort by them to say, we need to look at this more and do you feel that'll ever happen? Well, there's been some other guys. Chris Matthews made a couple comments uh, a couple months ago before the election um, when he had Tom Wolf on. He made some comments about Joe, and uh, Malcolm Gladwell had written a piece about this case, and is still, I know, you know, he's one of those guys that would be interesting to hear him weigh in on it. Um, but I think there's going to be more and more as we go. I think I think when when the NC, the NCA emails came out and the, everybody was aware that the free was working with the NCA, I think that, that turned a lot of people's heads. I know when Ed Ray admitted he hadn't read the free report or the consent decree, uh, I got some calls from some people that couldn't believe that. And they're so there's, without getting the names because I don't want to give too many things away. But there's a lot of people looking at this. You mentioned Governor Wolf. Has he said anything to you? Because I know that you're frustrated and disappointed with the trustees still today about maybe a different makeup of the board or maybe different appointees that he's thinking of having on the board of trustees. Not yet, but I think that'll come in time. But I think right now he's trying to, you know, having just got inaugurated, he's got a budget he's got to deal with and he's got an entire state to deal with right now with, you know, a deficit that, that he was not forecast to be as large as it is. So I think he's got some other things he's got to worry about now, but I think that's coming. And I know Senator Udacek from up in the coal region and, and uh, Senator Corman are still working on governance issues with the, with the board. So we'll see what happens with that. Senator Udacek, a very good friend of For the Record. We look to have him back sometime soon. The one other question that I do have, the lawsuit against the university. A lot of people nationally have said, that's just sour grapes. What would you say to those people? Well, I think they got to look at it. They need to look at the details of it. There are some things that were done, and the way certain things were handled that really put a lot of the assistant coaches in a bad spot. You know, when this story first broke, there were people all over the national media saying things to the effect that every assistant coach knew. We looked the other way. We're involved in, in covering up, and we went to the university and said, "You've got to let us fight this and combat combat this." And they did not allow us to respond at all for two weeks, which set into stone some things that were not fair as related to us. But there's some other things that were not handled correctly. Uh, agreements between employer and employee that, that they have not honored, but we did. Um, but also, you know, we need to really, the, the real crux of it is we gotta get to the truth. We gotta get to an understanding of why certain people in the board of, uh, the board of trustees 
uh, were willing to throw Penn State's reputation under the bus and willing to throw the reputation of a lot of good people under the bus as well while, the, while they were trying to get out from under this. Do you feel that when the trustees canceled that Tuesday press conference that happens every Tuesday, do you think that kind of not only pushed the big snowball off the cliff but set it on the runaway path that it ended up being? Oh, I, I think that had a major, major impact because uh, at that point, Joe was ready to go in, read a statement, answer a couple of questions, and kind of put it behind us. Uh, very, was very similar to the way Jim Beheim handled at Syracuse. Uh, but when they canceled that, when John Surma uh, was one of the trustees who was not the chairman of the board and really was not empowered to do that, he canceled that press conference. That created a media storm, and a lot of them ended up at my dad's house because they were waiting for somebody to, to come out and say something. So it really created this... And it also created this expectation that there was going to be a firing that day. Uh, so it just all it did was add fuel to fire. After everything that happened, your son Joey asked you, are we still going to be Penn State fans? How do you even answer that question? Well, that night I said to him very honestly, I don't know, because at that point I didn't know what was going to happen 20 seconds later, 20 hours later, 20 weeks later. But I've been to every, I'm obviously a Penn State fan. He's obviously still a Penn State fan. I've been to every home game since, since this all happened, haven't missed one. Um, so, you know, yeah, we are. But at that time, and I, and I answered it very, you know, I answered as honestly as I could that night. I can't let you go without asking you a couple football questions. Your impressions of the two staffs that have been here and how they've handled the transition from obviously following your father to where Penn State is at now under Coach Franklin. I think they've done a good job. You know, obviously, you know, it's not a it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. We'll see what happens over time. But I think you know we're, it's symptomatic of where we are in college football right now. Um, you know, the average head football coach in a major college football has been at a school less than three and a half years, um, and I think that's something that that Penn Staters are dealing with. You know, we had a guy for two years. We've had a guy for one year, and hopefully he'll stick around for a while. Um, but you know, there, it's not like it used to be, and and the money's gotten so big and. You look at the playoff and everybody loves it, but there's going to be, you don't get anything for nothing. And, and we're, the game has become so big, it's going to be hard to maintain the kind of uh, tight-knit family atmosphere that we had at Penn State for so many years. And I think the guys we've had have tried to do a good job of that. But we'll, you know, get, like I said, we'll see over time. Jay, thank you so much for being here. I'm having a great pleasure reading this book. It is The Paternal Legacy, Enduring Lessons from the Life and Death of My Father. That's Jay Paterno. I'm Andrew Twista. Thank you for watching this edition of WHL's For the Record.